Hertz has got it, wants to throw. Hertz setting up the screen. It is complete and blown up. Miles Sanders caught it. Malcolm Rodriguez was there waiting for him. That's a big play by Rodrigo. Welcome to week 11 in the NFL. This is the 20 Minute in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. And look, it's a good week 11, right? The Detroit Lions are coming off two consecutive wins. They're coming off their first road victory of the Dan Campbell era. And look, things are uh, things are, are feeling pretty good in Allen Park. And obviously a tough task this week heading on the road to face a New York Giants team that's 7-2. and two, That's very much in the uh, playoff picture in the NFC. And, and I think this is kind of a, a, a validation game for the Lions. I think if you can go on the road into New York and beat this Giants team, a team that doesn't make a lot of mistakes, um, that can obviously run the football with, with Saquon Barkley, um, and, and you can get your third straight win, I, I, I think you, you've, you're starting to have something here with Dan Campbell and this football team. But as we do every week, let's start with, with, with news and notes. And, and I think, you know, maybe one thing that got a little life on, on Wednesday was the return of DJ Chark. Uh, wide receiver's been on IR for the last four games. He's missed the last six games dealing with that left ankle injury. Um, he fractured that ankle last year, and it's just been kind of some residual pain, some some stuff he's been dealing with. So it was good to see him back on the practice field on Wednesday. Also back for the Lions was Romeo Okwara, veteran defensive end, led this team in sacks in 2020. And I think that's a big boost for, for both uh, you know, both sides of the football, if, if those guys are returning sooner rather than later. Obviously, the 21-day practice window starts. Okwara was on PUP. Um, uh, Chark was on IR. So, you know, now they've got 21 days. But um, it's, good, it's good to start those clocks. Good to get those guys back. I think that both those guys can, can give them a big boost uh, on either side of the ball um, if and when they do return. A little bit of update from, from Dan Campbell and Jamison uh, Williams, too. Um, looks like it's going to be after Thanksgiving. He's going to return to practice. They're going to kind of start that window as well, and, and we could see him in a Lions uniform potentially sometime in December down the, for, the, for the, you know, the final stretch of the season. Um, no setbacks with him. He's right on schedule. So that was good to hear, too. And it, it sounds like... You know, I know, I know a lot was made, you know, Sunday night of, of Frank Ragnow, you know, wearing the boot and, and leaving Chicago in a boot. But, um, you know, Frank didn't practice on Wednesday. That's become somewhat typical typical um as, and he's been just been dealing with that toe injury all year long I think that boot was maybe more of a precaution than it was something new or something that we didn't know about injury wise uh, I saw him in the locker room on Wednesday he wasn't limping around looked like same old Frank walked by said hello so um you know obviously we'll have to see how the week progresses but I think it's just one of those things that Frank's going to be dealing with this all all season long it just is what it is and it's, it's just how much he can kind of bear the the brunt of the pain. There might be some weeks where, where he can't go, but that's hasn't been the case so far, at least. Um, he's been able to battle through it and, and play at a pretty high level. So you hope that continues this week because he's obviously got a huge test this week in Dexter Lawrence. Their terrific nose tackle for the Giants. Five sacks, 17 quarterback hits, some unique production from that zero technique nose tackle position. Um, so Frank and those interior guys certainly have their uh, have their work cut out for them. And look, look three stats you know that were me about this week's game uh, you know we talk all the time about the big things being right turnovers uh, how good are you on third down and how, can you how good are you in the red zone yeah, I think those three stats are the key stats and when you look at the Giants turnover margin plus four they've only given the ball away eight times um, all year long that's you know second fewest in the NFL and Dan Campbell said you know this week look this is going to be big the Lions have been able to generate some turnovers in their last you know few games and those have been big plays especially the last two weeks to help them win games that's not something the Giants do a lot they're going to run the football and they'll punt it and you know they're not going to give you many opportunities the Lions got to generate them and then when you look at third down defense for them 32.7 percent second in the NFL red zone defense for them 38.2 percent second in the in the NFL, so you know, and, the, and to me, the mo the three biggest statistics in football: turnovers, third down, and red zone. Uh, that's a team that does it at a pretty pretty high level. Uh, you, you, some of the things that you know I like about the matchup: a couple maybe statistics I like about about Sunday that that favor the Lions. You know, this Giants defense is giving up 5.4 yards per rushing attempt. So look, they can run the football, but they give up some yards in the run too. And this is obviously a Detroit Lions football team that wants to run the football. Look, the, the 
Giants are going to try to control the time of possession, the clock, by running the football and, and, and doing that. I think the Lions need to counter that, have some success there too. And then when you look at that offense, you know, it's not one that, that hits you vertically. They have the fewest 20-yard completions in the NFL. So, again, a, a couple things that, that you like about the matchup if, if you're the Lions. So, look – it's, it's a big one to me because I think now you go on the road, you go win in New York, you're very much in, in the conversation. You're in the graphic, as P.J. Clark and I always talk about, and that's what you want to be, um, setting up a huge matchup, but just four days later on a short week on Thanksgiving at home against Buffalo. So, um, you know, big week. And, and look, we're going to break it all down with you here. I got Isaiah Bugs uh, on the show. He's been terrific the last few weeks, uh, defensive tackle veteran for the Lions. I've got Lomas Brown breaking down um, key matchups this week. Lom brings the energy. And I've got John Schmelk from um, uh, Giants.com. Uh, does a great job covering uh, the New York Giants for, for them. So a very busy show. we got a lot to get to. I hope you guys will stay with me. Welcome back to the 20 in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. And I'm, it's, it's great to talk to Giants reporter John Schmelk. He does a great job uh, covering the Giants in, in New York. And, and, John, thanks for joining me. Welcome to the 20 in the Huddle podcast. Uh, you, guys are, uh, you guys are flying pretty high there in New York lately, huh? Yeah, 7-2, and two, coming off a win against Houston, second place NFC East in a, in a season where I think a lot of people thought at this time of year we'd be talking more about who might be available in the you know top ten, top fifteen in the draft, and instead we're talking playoffs. It's a good place to be. You know, in eight of those nine wins, John, uh, or eight in the nine games, excuse me, and 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 seven wins, one score games, and it just what what has it been about this Giants team that that they've been able to kind of you know make those critical plays late in games find you know th- those moments to make a play in, in, in those close games because it seems like it's every week for you guys yeah i've asked a bunch of different players that there's like some kind of secret sauce or something and, and nobody's <laughs> really given me a, a great answer on that to be honest with you i just think this team's been playing great situational football all year uh they're the second best like if you look at their overall numbers on defense like yards allowed and you look at you know some of the guys out there especially with Xavier McKinney out you're like eh but then you look, all right, second and third down defense, second and red zone defense. And they just tend to make the big plays on that side of the ball when they need to late in these games. And throwing the fact offensively, you know, they haven't, as much as it is them making big plays at the end of the games, and, you know, they've had a bunch of comebacks this year, and, you know, and they've done really comeback wins with running the ball rather than throwing it, which is something that's not very common. And this team also hasn't shot themselves in the foot and made big mistakes in big situations. So, I think they've just been really good in close games because they're good on third down. They're good in the red zone on both sides and they've run the ball well and avoided big mistakes. And, you know, that's been the formula. They haven't scored in the thirties yet this year in terms of points. It's been close games between 17 and 24 points for the most part. And so far they're seven and one of those one score games. And they've been fortunate to come out on top. Odds are that'll even out at some point this year, but enjoy the ride while, while they're where they're at. Yeah, enjoy the ride. I know you guys still got Dallas coming up. You got two against the Eagles. I think you got Minnesota, right? So, you know, you've got you've got a tough schedule. I think it's one of the toughest schedules in the NFL the rest of the way, but what a terrific start for you guys. You, you know, you mentioned the run game, and, and, and Saquon's coming off that 35-carry, 152-yard game. And, and, and I, I'm just curious, he's at 227 touches. I think he's on pace for like 430 touches. Is there any concern at all with, with, with that much of a load and, and that much emphasis on the run game? I mean, obviously, whatever works, you, you do, right? Um, but, but is there any concern that, that, that the pass game maybe hasn't caught quite up yet? And, and, and when you're put into a situation, when New York's put into a situation where they've got to throw, are they confident that they can do that to win football games as well? Yeah, and I think we saw that two weeks ago against, or I guess three weeks ago, two games ago against Seattle where Seattle basically sent their weak side linebacker up the field to take away Daniel Jones in the run game. You know, none of those naked boots, none of that read option. He's been a big part of what they do running the ball too. And they also stacked the box against Saquon Barkley. And the Giants could not do enough through the air to counteract Seattle, you know, making those decisions and game planning that way. Yeah, look, look, their their receiver position's a mess. They've had a bunch of injuries this year. Uh, Kadarius Tony didn't work out their first round pick last year. Kenny Holliday's. Been out of the lineup, came back last week, had a big drop, and then was basically pulled at halftime and didn't play in the second half. 
And, you know, they're basically rolling in guys they've pulled up off the scrap heap all year. You know, Isaiah Hodgins played for the first time last week. He was their, you know, third biggest snap count guy at the receiver position. Wando Robinson's a rookie. You know, Darius Slayton was almost let go at the end of training camp. He was inactive the first two weeks, and now he's the number one wide receiver. So, yes, if there is a kryptonite with this Giants team on offense, it's their passing game. Uh, They have the fewest passes of 20-plus yards in the air in the NFL, attempts and completed, and it's just something they haven't been very good at this year. So the good news for them is that teams really haven't figured out a way to shut down Saquon Barkley yet for the most part, as you mentioned, with all those touches. I don't think there's much concern for his workload just because he's missed so much time the last three years with injuries that, you know, I think his body's pretty fresh, and this is their formula to win games, and they're going to keep doing it. You know, you mentioned Kenny Galladay, and uh, obviously, you know, Detroit Lions fans are familiar with him, uh, you know, third round pick and and was so successful here. I mean, back to back thousand yard seasons and then left, obviously signed the big free agent deal. Just why do you think, John, it it hasn't worked out there in New York? Because I think from a Lions fans perspective, that's really surprising considering how productive he was here in Detroit. Yeah, that's kind of like the 60 million dollar question, right? Um, (laughs) Yeah. And the Giants need him to be good. You know, they paid him all that money last offseason. That was a different regime that brought him in, obviously. And then last year, he had some injury issues. And then Daniel Jones got hurt. And you have, you know, Mike Glennon and Jake Fromm throwing to him behind a bad offensive line. So he didn't have much of a chance last year, given the situation around him and, and the injuries. And this year, look, he was given first team reps in training camp. He was the starter on opening day. He came back and he was their starting X receiver when he came back from the injury against the Texans last week. And he just hasn't been able to take advantage of his opportunities. You know, he's really struggling to get any level of separation in the contested catch opportunities he has had. He just hasn't had a lot of success with it. I'm not sure him and Daniel have gained the same chemistry in those situations that Stafford and Galladay did when they were in Detroit. And he's had some big drops. I mean, he had a pass in the first half against the, against Houston last week where he's running a, just a plain shallow cross in a little two-minute drill situation at the end of the first half, Daniel Jones puts it right on him, hits it right in between the one and the nine, and he drops it. And he's had too many of those plays this year. And I don't know if maybe he just lost some bit of athleticism and confidence after that hip injury that he had at the end of his Detroit tenure, but there's just something that's not there. And it's hurting the Giants because they do need someone at wide receiver to step up, and maybe he will in his next opportunity, but he hasn't so far. I'm talking with uh, John Smelk, the uh, Giants.com reporter, does a great job there in New York. And, well, let's go to the other side of the ball, John, and let's talk about a real positive and a guy who is taking advantage of of his opportunities, uh, Dexter Lawrence. I mean, what can you say about this guy? I mean, five sacks, 17 quarterback hits, and he's doing it from the nose tackle position. And that that's you don't see that very often in, in the NFL. I mean, those guys are run stuffers. You know, two-gap guys is, is normally what you see with that, you know, how has he been able to be so successful, you know, pretty much lining up over over the center in, in that zero technique? Yeah, that, that's that been the big change for him this year. They've used him right over the center a lot more than what the Giants had in the past. He was more of a shade player. He would play a little bit over the guard, too. But he never, wasn't really over the center a ton. That's just not how the Giants, you know, lined up their defensive linemen under their previous uh, defensive coordinator, and Patrick Graham. You know, combine that with the way they the the new defensive regime, Wink Martindale, um, Patterson, the defensive line coach, the way they've allowed him to, you know, use his hands more and really use his length and athleticism against these centers right after they snap the football. And I think that's really been the difference for him. And he's been their defensive MVP, to be quite honest with you. And he's brought a pass rush to the ability uh, pass rush ability to the field that he hadn't shown previously and throwing Leonard Williams, who missed some games with injury. I think Andre Patterson, again, the defensive line coach that came over from the Vikings has done wonders with Dexter Lawrence. He's helped with Leo uh, Leonard Williams. And really, if not for the other great defensive tackles in the NFC, and there's a lot of them, I would say Dexter Lawrence should be an all pro candidate. Now he might not because of the other guys in the conference that are so good, but yeah, he's been a tremendous player inside. 
And, you know, as you know, John, any quarterback will tell you the, the worst pressure that they can receive is that pressure right in their face, right up the middle. Um, I mean, it, it can be so disruptive with everything. And so, you know, he's having, you know, terrific season. And I was looking forward to the matchup this week with Frank Ragnall, one of the best centers in the league. But we'll have to see if kind of that materializes. You know, Frank left uh, the, the Chicago game in a boot. Uh, Dan Campbell, the head coach here, said he's kind of day to day. We'll see where it's at. And so, um, you know, facing a guy guy like Dexter and and maybe not having your Pro Bowl center that that could be a big edge for New York even though Evan Brown Detroit's backup has played really well when given the opportunity to play there but that's something interesting to watch this week I want to ask you about another defensive guy you know obviously Aiden Hutchinson and Kayvon Thibodeau are going to be kind of linked um, along with Trayvon Walker the, 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 the first three pass rushers taken in the draft there um, I know Kayvon dealt with some injuries earlier in the year, just how is he developing? How is he coming along and, and, and playing outside to, to Dexter and, and him playing so well? How has that benefited um, K, uh, Kayvon? Yeah, he injured his MCL at the very end of training camp. I think it was at the final preseason game, if I recall, where he got rolled up on, or rather it was um, one of those blocks where the tight end comes by and he went low on Thibodeau. Thibodeau didn't see, and his leg kind of got hyperextended. And the worry was that he had an ACL. So I, he, everyone kind of breathed a sigh of relief when it was just the MCL. And he came back in week four, I believe it was. And it's been slow getting back. He's still wearing that knee brace. He's still, in my opinion, uh, he he probably argue with me, isn't showing the same burst that we saw in camp. So it's been slow going from a pass rush perspective. He's had some good moments in the run game. He has been caught up field a couple times. But yeah, he is not given the, pro- the consistent pass rush production that Hutchinson has given the Lions so far this year. You know, he has to develop a a wider variety of moves. He usually just tries to win outside with his length and speed. We haven't seen that many inside counters yet. But look, the talent, the explosion, the athleticism is there. You know, despite all the talk in the draft, there's been no motor issues. He's He plays hard. He's into it. He's into football. He's The coaching staff loves him. He just hasn't had that pass rush production show up yet. How's Brian Dable to cover? He's, he seems like a pretty fun guy to, to, to cover. Yeah, he's really chill. I mean, he's, you know, the best way I can describe it is I w- I've been in this building since 2007. So I was here for Tom Coughlin, who I love. I learned so much about football and life from that guy. He could coach my team any day. He's the best, you know, and then on an array of coaches. And Brian Dable is by far the most approachable guy that I've ever been in a building with in terms of head coaches, like you can just chat him up in the hallway. He's, you know, talks to you like you're, he talks like a regular person and he just, I think he's very inviting. And I think that's the impact he has on the team where he's very honest with them. He can talk to them very honestly, like a regular person. And I think he relates to them. Well, with that said, he's got a temper now. Like if you go back <laughs> in the game last week, the giants had a fourth and one, one of their backup offensive linemen, Jack Anderson, commits a false start penalty. He goes to the bench and he rips him. He's screaming at him. He screamed at Daniel Jones on a bad interception earlier in the year. He'll do it to anybody. So while it's kind of like a, a more of a family relaxed atmosphere where, you know, the relations with the players are good and it's very open and honest, he's pretty hardcore when it comes to discipline and making sure guys are doing their jobs. He is from the Bill Belichick school now. So a lot of that has rubbed off on him, but it has been a pleasure. You know, him and Joe Shane have really brought a good culture to the building. And of course, you know, starting the year seven and two doesn't hurt either. You know, I listened to his press conference on on Monday, and he said, "Hey, look, those guys can yell back at me too. You know, I I I'll take it a little bit too. So uh, he's he'll give it, but he'll he'll take it too." Yeah, no question. The other thing too that I like about him is that you really don't know. You wouldn't know if you just look at his demeanor and his way he talks and looks after a win and a loss. He's just always the same guy. While he has those kind of burst of anger and temper on the sideline, I think when he kind of talks to the media and addresses the team. He's always seems to be the same. It's very consistent. And I, and I think that's a good thing long-term. You know, obviously for the Lions, you know, the key Sunday is going to be stopping Saquon Barkley and, and, and that that run game. I think you guys are third in the NFL and rushing over 160 yards per game. So so that's obviously the key. But what's been the talk in New York? What do they say is, is kind of the key um, to coming away with a victory against Detroit on Sunday? What, what, what's maybe that key matchup for them? Yeah, that, that that's actually a really good question. I think I think the Giants think they can score points against the Lions. Uh, you know, your defense has struggled at times this year. Run the and the Giants formula is not going to change, right? They're going to try to win by running the football. 
They'll run a ton of play action. The Giants have the highest play action rate in the NFL. A lot of running it, a lot of play action, a lot of short, quick passes, not a lot of deep stuff down the field generally. And I think the question is, how can the Giants defense do against which what's probably one of the, sorry about that. I have a motion sensor light in here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, how will the Giants defense lights out? Uh, how will the Giants defense do against what's probably the best offense they've seen this year? And I think that's really the question. Um, you know, the lines are top 10 in offense. They move the football, you know, the Giants, their second and third cornerbacks, Fabian Moreau, you know, Darnay Holmes, can they hang with a better group of wide receivers? Now, who the Lions are going to have outside of Montrose and Brown, we'll see. Uh, the Giants have the second-best red zone defense in the league. The Lions had the fifth-best red zone offense. So can the Giants keep this up as they start playing some better offenses? So I think that's kind of what you're looking at here. You know, can the Giants get pass rush against what's one of the better offensive lines in football that Detroit has? And can they hang with the Lions, you know, passing and rushing attack? Because the Giants have had issues in their pass and run defense in different games this year, depending on what game you're talking about. So that I think is, is kind of what the concern is here, how the giants defense hangs against a, frankly, an opponent that, that that's much better than some of the opponents, especially through the air that they've seen this year. Well, John, it should be a, a you know, fun when Detroit lions kind of check some boxes off for, for Dan Campbell, getting that first road win, getting back-to-back wins. They're playing much better football. And obviously the giants at seven, two, seven and two are very much in the playoff picture in the NFC. So big one in New York on Sunday, John, thanks for joining me so much. I appreciate it. Great stuff. And I'll make sure I stop by and say hello in New York on, uh, on Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think either one of us thought we'd have the Fox a team doing the game for giants <laughs> and lions in week 11, but here we are. Can't wait to see you on Sunday, Tim. Should be fun. Uh, I like it. Good stuff, John. Welcome back to the 20 in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. And I am joined by Isaiah Bugs, defensive tackle here, for the glad Detroit to, Lions. Yep, glad to be on here. You know, and we have to start with this, Isaiah, because you and Aiden Hutchinson have this little thing going in the locker room. <laughs> now, now there's, there is a pool table in the locker room, right. and there's this whiteboard that has messages. But the only thing that I see on the big corner of that whiteboard is Isaiah Bugs 3, Aiden Hutchinson, two. Now, that's that's the pool count right now, right? That's the pool count, man. We kind of going back and forth with the pool game, man. And he wins one, I wins one. But today I kind of got him, as you see. <laughs> uh, so when I go back in the locker room, he's going to be on me about getting this rematch. <laughs> so but, I'm going to try to make it four, two. You know, how fun is that? And, and, and how much is that needed, too? You guys got, you know, ping pong table in there. Mm-hmm. I know some video games are in there. Just that time after practice. Now, obviously, you guys come to work, you get your work done. Right. But you got to have time to deep compress a little bit too and, and does that bring you guys together as Man, a locker that's, room a little that's, bit too? that's something that's needed that's a team bond thing you know you know every time we come in the doors it shouldn't be, always be about work 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 sometimes when we get those breaks that's a time for us to get together as teammates and play pool you know play the game and you know ping pong and stuff like that so we can have our me time yeah. but it's still about business when we go to work it's about that but it's a, it's, a, it's a good time for us to have a little leeway and enjoy each other's company. Let's talk about last week. Big win for for you guys. Yeah. First one of the Dan Campbell era on the road. But two in a row for you guys and, and starting to build these right. things. I mean, to get two, you got to get one. To get three, you got to get two, right? right. You got to start stacking these things together. Just how big of a win was that for you guys on the road? Man, that was real big. And honestly, I didn't believe the people understood what Dan was saying when we was this close. Mm-hmm. And now you guys starting to see what he was talking about. You know, we we kind of bit ourselves in the butt by making mistakes that cost us. If you go look at those games, we wasn't in the right position to make this play. We were in the right position to make that play. And we had to learn how to find our identity and come together as a group and start executing game plans. That's what he was mean by we was that close. And now and things starting to gel together for us. So now we're actually having fun with it. We're winning. And, you know, it's, that was a big win for us to yeah. be on the road. And I, that was that was a long time. Detroit Lions won in a long time. 
time on the yeah. road, I heard. And, you know, that was a great feeling for me and also for the team and the coaches, man. That was a good, great feeling. And don't shoot yourself in the foot either, right? Turnovers. You guys, right. It was a clean yeah. game. And you saw when, yep. when, when, when Chicago was the one to make the mistakes, you guys had two penalties, no turnovers. Right. So right. when you, like to your point, when you don't shoot yourself in the foot, right, right. And, yep. and make some of those mistakes, right. um, you guys are right there talent-wise to be able to win football games right, like that man. on the road. We had a clean game, and that's what, that's what the coaches want us to do. When we have a clean game and we execute the game mm -hmm. plans, we win. How much of a headache was it trying to tackle Justin Fields the other day? Hey, man, I <laughs> <laughs> much respect to him, man. He, he's a great ball player. You know, he's very well respected for what he can do with his legs, man. And you've seen in that game, I had a couple missed sacks on him. Uh, other guys had missed sacks on him. But he, he's a great player. You know, he's doing a great job over there. Much respect to him. But what you didn't miss was that huge interception. I don't know if, if fans remember <laughs> this, is that it was your pressure there. You know, Aiden did a nice job kind of feeling what was happening right. behind him with, with the tight end slipping. Right. That allowed him to you – know, that forced, you know, Justin maybe hold it a little bit. Right. And then you were right there beating down on him. So between your rush – Aiden kind of identifying it, make him hold, and then obviously Jeff making the play. Yeah. I mean, that's what it's supposed to look like, Man, right? that's 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 what that's what it's all about. It starts from the front end to the back end, mm -hmm. and you know when I seen that opportunity to get on him, I went and got him, but I didn't I didn't want to be too much that I miss him like I did once. Right. So I, I just stayed in front of him, like the coaches preached all week that we stay in front of him, occupy him, and, and don't let him get by you. And that's what I did, and it created a turnover, and it created us for seven points for the defense, which caused us to help win that game. Man. Huge moment in the game. Right. Now you've got a obvious another test this week and Daniel and Jones. Boy, Saquon yeah. <laughs> and it is a big but Daniel Jones too and, and we were kind of chatting on the way up here, but does it help at all that, that you just faced a running quarterback? Now and Daniel Jones isn't the, the athlete that, mm -hmm. that Justin is. Obviously they're a little bit different player, but he's rushed for hundred yards, right, yeah. you know, in a game um this year and, and you know he, he can make plays with his legs. Does it help that that's almost fresh in your mind? Maybe, maybe the game plan's a little bit similar? Oh uh, yes, but it is uh, it start up front by knocking that run out, man. And they're yeah. gonna feed twenty six the ball thirty and thirty five times a game. That's 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 they macho. That's what they want to do. They want to run and pound the football. And we got to be solid up front. You know, we got to have we got to have varsity play up front from the big guys and control the run game. And also Daniel Jones, he he can get it done with his feet too, man. We got to make these quarterback beat us in the air. That's, that's what it's about. Is, is, is sick. When he looks like a guy, and Dan mentioned this today, it's two <laughs> yards, one yard, minus three, four, four, 27, 64. Right. Is it just you, you, every single play you got to be conscious of it and you can't take a play off with a right. guy like that? Man, like they said and like we said in meeting today, they don't mind punting the ball. They don't mind punting the ball. But between those first and second downs, they're going to run that ball. And when they run it, they don't have to get a whole bunch of yards right then. They're going to mm -hmm. keep punching at it, punching at it. Like I said, gain the two yards, gain the four or five. Then there you go 15, yeah. 20. That's that's how they operate. You know, they they like to stay on schedule with their offense. But we got to knock that out. We got to be on schedule with our defense by stopping the run so they can beat us in the air. That's so, what we want to do. So what's the key for you guys up front, especially this week? Uh, we got to dominate, uh, stay in our gaps, get our blocks execute the game plans, be in the right gaps when we need to be, and just overall execution, you yeah, know, see, and get our blocks. I say you're coming from an organization in Pittsburgh that, that you know, won a lot of games, mm -hmm. obviously. And and what does it mean for, for this young defense that the last two weeks it's been you guys on the field at the end of mm -hmm. game in crucial moments that have helped win this game? Is it almost one of those things where, where confidence breeds success and you can almost see that in some of the young guys now? Uh, most definitely, man. Like, when you look into some of these players' eyes here, they all lend to it, they, and they want to win. And when you get around a group of guys that want to win, man, the outcome is amazing. You know, man, when I was in the Steelers, we had a lot of guys that wanted to win. But it was more so of, of more so sometime it was individual play and stuff like that. But here in Detroit, everybody's a team. You know, everybody's helping each other. Everybody wants to win. Yeah. Like, it's, it, yeah, you have individual statistics and all that stuff. But here is it's a family here. When we on the field, off the field, everybody want to win. And, and that's where it comes down to those, to, those, to those crunch moments at the end of the game. We we've been in this situation before, so that's why we know how to execute it and win it. It just seems like you guys needed that. 
like you needed that more. You've been so close in, in so many games early in the season, but to, to get over the edge and then validate it and do it again the next week that it wasn't, hey, it, this just happened one time. Like, right. This can be us. This can be yeah. our DNA, right? We can make these plays, right. and, we, and we and we can dominate and be in, in, at the end of a game. I feel confident in the guys we got on this team, man, that we can get it done. That's what that's what Coach Campbell was saying. We was this close. Yeah. You know, and now we're starting to put it together. We got the guys in the room to get the job done. As you guys see, we two in a row. We can get it done. You know, just execution. Wanted to ask you about Aiden a little bit outside of the pool table. Okay, we we, we know you're you got him covered there. He's got a little he's got a little improving to do yeah, on the pool he got table. Yeah, a long way to go to catch up with me on the pool table, man. But on the football field, how is how have you seen him progress and grow over the last? 11 weeks. To me, I, I, I look at the play that he made against Green Bay, the interception, mm -hmm. the play that we talked about mm -hmm. earlier. It almost seems maybe like the game's slowing down a little mm -hmm. bit for him. He, he's recognizing, seeing yeah. things in front of him. But I'm just curious from your perspective, a guy that lines up next to him, sometimes side by side to him, wh wh where have you seen that progression with him? Man, Aiden, he, he's coming along. He's a great player. And it's kind of hard sometimes when you're a first-round draft pick because, you know, you got all eyes on you. Like, you got a job to prove to a lot of people. Yeah. And, you know, when sometimes when you start off slow, that's when you start losing interest in other people and stuff like that. And sometimes it gets you, but that didn't get to Aiden. You yeah. know, he, he kept going, he kept going. And you can see his play has been amazing, man. He's been rising in the charts in every category, every game. For him to be a rookie and making noise like that, he, he he's a great player, man. And, and I love watching him. I love playing beside him. Well, you're also playing some pretty darn good football right now. Yeah. I mean, you're going to whiz past your, your your you know your tackle totals and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Just getting an opportunity here. I mean, you had your football journey is obviously went to community college, weren't heavily recruited, and and, and then played so well that the Alabamas, the LSU's, all of them yeah. came coming, and, and you obviously went to Alabama, had a great. Right. A, a, you know, great career there. Started in Pittsburgh, signed here. But just, how proud of you of of of, of kind of where you've come as a football player too? Because it looks like you're playing some of your best ball. Man, your I had to I had to finally realize my worth in me. And you know, growing up and and getting it up, getting the football and stuff like that, it was harder for me. I came from Reston, Louisiana, Reston High School. It really not a heavy recruited town. Mm -hmm. So I had to figure out a way to get it done. So JUCO was my only option. I went to Mississippi Gulf Coast, and I had great coaches over there, uh, Steve Davis, uh, Irvin Moore, Big Mo, and all those, Coach Huff and all those guys at Mississippi Gulf Coast, man. They 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 made myself kind of believe that I can get it done, man. And I went in there, head down, went to work at junior college, man. Those who've been to junior college know no. <laughs> it's a grind, bro. Yeah. It's, it's a grind, man. You don't have all the nice facilities. You don't have all the nice jerseys locker room and all that stuff in, in junior college. It's, it's a real life get it out of the mud situation. And, you know, when I went in and I went to work, that's when the Alabamas came, the LSU, and I had every offer from, from every school all over, man. I knew that I was putting in the work and the time to make it there, you know. And Nick Saban gave me a chance. I went over there and went to work. And, you know, and I got drafted by the Steelers, you know, and I went in and went to work there, and everything didn't work out there. So a new senior was best for me. And, Dan and AG and the Detroit Lions family welcome me in over here, man, and it's been awesome for me. I can be myself, and I'm and I'm playing great ball because I know I'm capable of doing that. And they put me in a situation to be successful, man. Like I just do what the coaches say yeah. and follow the game plan. And like AG said, man, if you follow the game plan, all the good stuff gonna come to you. And that's basically what has been happening with me. Just been doing my job. I'm not trying to be a hero. I'm not trying to be that main guy. I'm just doing my job that they asked me to do, and everything kind of falling in my hands that way. It, it, it is falling in your and that it falling in your hands, and that's a good story for all the young players out there who maybe don't see themselves on the stars and all that right. other stuff. Yeah. That you just put your head down, and go to work, and, yeah. and the NFL will find you. Yeah, they're gonna find you. It's gonna happen, man. No matter what school you at, junior college, D one, D two, D three, they're gonna find you, man. They're gonna find you. All right, Thanksgiving's coming up. Is there a, a Thanksgiving must for you? Something you have to have? Something that's on the the, the Bugs family table there that that I'm is a favorite? You, I'm gonna tell you right now. We gotta have some chitlins. Some chitlins. Some chitlins, man. Okay. We gotta have we gotta have some chitlins for uh, for Thanksgiving. It's a must. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> well, you're playing some really good football right now. This defense is starting to play really mm -hmm. good, you know, especially at the end of games there, taking advantage of those scenarios. Let's make it three in a row. Yeah, we can. Wouldn't we that be can, big? It will be big for us to do three in a row, and I think we can get it done. Just execute the game plan and just buy into what these coaches got for us this week, and we're going to win it.
Sounds I believe good. we I believe we're gonna win. All right, man. Thanks yeah, for joining. Appreciate me. you. I appreciate no problem, you. brother. Thank appreciate you. It. Welcome back to the 20 Minute Huddle podcast. It is now time for key matchups presented by BetMGM. And my guest this week needs no introduction at all. <laughs> he is a Pro Bowl player and a Detroit Lions legend. Oh, I like and that. And the color commentator for the Lions Radio Network. You got your hand in a little bit of everything, Yeah, Lowe. yeah. It sounds like the big fellow's important. I like that, TT. He, he is like Lomas it. Brown. And I love the fact that he is joining me for key matchups this week. I had uh, TJ Lang on a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago when we were playing Green, uh, Green Bay. And I thought, hey, what perfect. You know, guy who played for Green Bay, guy who played for Detroit. Let's invite Lom on. <laughs> Lom has played for the New York Giants. Yeah. He's played obviously for the De- for the Detroit Lions. So you know a little bit about uh, both uh, organizations. And and Lom, we just go through five key matchups every week. And sure. and let's start with the big one, in my opinion, and, and it's Saquon Barkley versus Alex Anzalone. And really, it's, it's going to take more than Alex Anzalone. But you know, he's the one with with the green dot. He's the one that I think has been playing really, really well the last few weeks in yes. terms of you know, um, you know, trying to contain. Um, that that run game and and when you look at Barkley, man, 227 touches this year. He leads the league in rushing. He's on pace alone for 429 touches. Ooh. I mean, they are running wow. that young man, and and he's playing pretty well. Yeah, and they they have to TT. I think they have to utilize him in both the run and the pass game because to me, he is the cog. He is the that the cog that makes that engine work over there. And to me, if you could get him. The thing about Saquon that's just so impressive is that, yeah, he can run the ball between the tackles, but we all know just how explosive he is if we could get get him out in space. He's a guy that needs to be out in space. I like the little fella that I blocked for. <laughs> Not as good as that little fella that I blocked for, but that's the thing we tried to do. We tried to get the one-on-one matchups with him, either him on the linebacker, either in the run game or in the pass game. And then what you wanted to try to do is just manufacture plays where you could get him out in space, get him out in the open so he can make those special moves and do some of the things that he's known for doing. So the Lions will. They're going to have to where's Waldo. It's going to have to be where's Saquon each and every play because they line him up. Brian Dabo does a great job of lining them up in different positions, the backfield, slot. I've even seen them go out wide. So it's a lot of different things that he could do with them. And, of course, they want to get the ball in his hands and see what he could do after the uh, after he gets the ball. Yeah, it's a good point by you, Lone, because they and they also get him the ball. All when they're in those spots. I mean, sometimes they'll line goes, guys up wide and it's a decoy maybe to right. move the deep, but the, they try to get him the ball in all those different spots too. And tackling is going to be so important yes. this week with yes. him because, I, you know, you mentioned the, the little guy that you used to block for, and that was probably the frustrating thing for, for defenses. You'd do so well, you'd contain him, you'd contain him, and then he would just find a way one run for, for 75 yards that, that changed the whole outcome of the game. And I think Saquon is a similar player where you can bottle him up, but you've got to be really really good because it just takes one with him. You're exactly right, TT. And the thing that I've been impressed with with the Lions' defense over the last maybe like two weeks is I'm noticing that these guys are really trying to funnel everything back to the middle. So they're really taking a lot of pride on trying to keep contained, not letting those guys get outside and forcing it back where your help is because that's where your help is going to be at. That's where you're going to get guys to be able to gang tackle a Saquon Barkley. And just like you said, Said the most important thing to me, first guy have an opportunity to make that tackle, he got to make that tackle, TT. He has to because it just creates so many other problems when you don't when the first guy doesn't make that we tackle. We saw that last week with Absolutely. Justin Fields. You know? Absolutely. You're right. <laughs> well, let's let's flip over to a different part, a different aspect of their offense. And and you know, second matchup to me is, is Daniel Jones, their quarterback, mm-hmm. versus Aaron Glenn. You know, and, and you mentioned it the last couple of weeks they've played much better football defensively. Now I know last week you looked at the at the yardage and and stuff like that, but that's a that, they've done that against everybody, yes. and they've been consistent with it. And and look, you made the plays to win the game at the end, and and, and I think Aaron Glenn's done a good job the last couple of weeks of putting those guys in good situations I at agree. the end of games to make plays. But it's a little bit different beast this week because. This isn't a dynamic passing attack from yeah. New York at all. Right. I mean, you know what you have to do. You've right. got to put nine in the box. You've got to dare them to beat you throwing the football. Now, they look, they lead the league in play-action passes, but it's, it's really – 
Loam a, a short passing game. They don't go vertical a lot. Just what's the key to that matchup in, in, in stopping their passing game? Is it as simple as, you know, being good on first and second down, putting them in some bad situations where they have to try to do something that they're uncomfortable with? I think so. I think Daniel Jones is a guy. I think he's going to give you an opportunity, TT. I think we played a couple of quarterbacks. I thought Geno Smith was a guy that would give you an opportunity. You have to take advantage of it. I know I'm forgetting one other quarterback. Oh, Kirk Cousins. Yeah. A quarterback that would give you the opportunity. You just have to take advantage of it. And I kind of put Daniel Jones kind of in that same group. He's going to give you some opportunities. To me, you can see Brian Dayball kind of, like you saying, shortening up everything because he doesn't want to put too much on this plate. He don't want his quarterback thinking. He wants his quarterback to react or come out and be kind of be on, on rhythm with everything. So to me, with uh, and we already, <laughs> TT, we already know what we're going to get. The things that's been killing our defense, right? The mobile quarterback. Yeah. But even just the quarterback that just rolls out. He yeah. don't have to roll out the run he can roll out and for some problems it's been giving us a lot of problems this year covering either the flat guy that they sent out or that intermediate guy that comes out so I think you're going to see a lot of that with uh, Daniel Jones rolling either way trying to get out the pocket trying to get uncomfortable but to me to me, he doesn't get his eyes downfield as much as some of those good quarterbacks. So when you get him out the pocket, I think he looks to run. Yeah. And that, and to me, that can be an advantage for the Lions because, again, you know a guy that's not going to break out like a, a Aaron Rodgers, break out looking downfield so he could get the ball downfield. He's going to break out and he's going to try to get the first down to get as much yardage as he can. So I think that might make it a little easier on yeah. the defense, but he's still a threat with his legs. He can still get out with his legs. And is there a benefit then having come off a game where you just faced a quarterback Great like that Great in Justin point. Fields? So that's fresh on your mind, Great right? Point. That was the game plan, plan last week. And so now obviously Daniel Jones is as dynamic right. as Justin Fields, but to your point, He'll still do it, and he's very willing. And so I guess that's fresh off maybe some of the same concepts defensively. Absolutely. You just watched that. So, um, again, those guys were in the locker room watching what they did wrong against Justin Fields. You know, So they're learning what they need to do better on, say, like a guy like a Justin Fields. Well, you know you're not dealing with that type of speed or that type of athleticism with a Daniel Jones. He's still capable. I mean, he had over 100 yards rushing in the game earlier this year. So he's still capable of hurting you on the ground, but it's just not that dynamic big play that I think can get out the gate like a Justin Fields can. All right, let's talk about uh, uh, Detroit offensively. Um, you know, obviously, there's going to be a lot of talk this week about Kayvon Thibodeau, yeah. the number five pick, and, and Aiden Hutchinson, the number two pick. But you know, let's also talk about some Oregon on Oregon crime, too, <laughs> yeah. right? Because you're going to see Penny Sewell yes. and, and Kayvon Thibodeau match up quite a bit here. Let's start with that one first. Um, you know, Thibodeau obviously you know, had the eight, the MCL injury, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's kind of slow to come back. But, you know, one sack, three quarterback hits, Loam, seven. Seven total pressures. I don't think yeah. that's the impact that um, New York was hoping for. I think you know he still looks like he's wearing that knee brace. Might not be yeah. the same kind of cat, but um, th that's going to be a huge matchup for for Penny, right? Because that's a little different of a guy, right? That's, that's a speed guy. It's a speed guy, but I just think Penny Sewell should have the the advantage over that because one, of course, being in the league a little longer than um, Thibodeau has been. But, again, familiarity with him. I'm quite sure those guys went up against each other. Maybe not a lot, but I'm quite sure they went up against yeah. each other in practice as Oregon. So, in, at Oregon. So, you you just put that in your your, your, your data file back here in the back of the brain. <laughs> Did you have a big old yeah, data file? Yeah, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> TT, man, you have to drum it up sometime. Okay, what the, what the move does this guy like to do? And I'm quite sure. I know Panay Sewell, he's going to go back. He's probably going to think back to some of the battles what what uh, Thibodeau likes to do when he get wide, what does he like to do? When he lines up tight over me, what does he like to do? So it's, it'll be a lot of things that I think will help uh, Panay Sewell against Thibodeau. And then the other thing, too, with him, 
TT, what I'm finding, it's a little bit with Aiden Hutchinson. When those guys, they got to develop a second move. Mm. And that's something that's going to come along. Yeah. But I, you could just see once the tackle gets his hands on those guys, then they don't really know what to do. Aiden and, and him, they just seem to f- uh, swell and, you know, try to get off that way. When you need to come up with either arm swim, a slap and move, you have to come up with a second move when these offensive linemen get their hands on you. And like I say, they're young. They're, you know, they're young yeah. guys. This is something that they're going to learn. They're going to get better at, and it's going to make them a better player. But right now, I get Panay Sewell. I give him the advantage, you know. So I would love to see Thibodeau line up over him because I think we have the advantage. And also, I do think Taylor Decker have the advantage over him too. So we're back to your playing days. What was the, the, the more difficult guy to, to, to block? Was it the speed guy on the outside or was it those J.J. Watt kind of those guys? Those guys. big guys. Yes, that were just- man. Because I had the Richard Dents. I had the Chris Dolmans. You know, even Lawrence Taylor. You know, those are the three best that I ever faced. And those guys could either run around you, they could run through <laughs> through UTT, or they go on, you know, they could yeah. come up on, uh, underneath you. And that's the hard thing when you face guys that can do all three. A speed guy, I'm going to sit on his inside number. I'm going to force him to run the hump every time. There's no way I'm going to let a speed guy beat me inside. I'm going to just make him run around the corner, tell my quarterback, hey, just, just step, step up, up in the pocket and deliver your pass. Now, is that made – is that task made a little bit more difficult this week because of our <laughs> – let's talk about our next matchup a little bit. Let's talk about Dexter Lawrence. Yes. And look, we'll see if it's Frank Ragnow, right? He left Chicago in a boot. Yeah. Looks like that's going to be something that we're going to have to monitor this week. Um, you know, I know uh, – Evan Brown's done a good job when he stepped in there, but boy, this, yes. this Dexter Lawrence, he's 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 That's a, different a different kind beast. of guy. That's a different. I mean, beast you're talking right about a, a, a true kind of zero tech, right? Nose yes. tackle. That's where he's lining up. Yes. Five quarterback sacks, seventeen quarterback hits that's from crazy. the nose tackle position. That's crazy. That's yeah, I mean, Aaron that's, Donald numbers. If you think about yeah. it, but I'm, I'm I think that might be better. He plays than the Aaron. three tech. That's mostly, what I'm saying. That's a, yeah, and they move so, him around yeah. too. T. So lining up right over there. I mean, that's a good point. Is that 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 that's rare? That's right? that's unusual. Though. I think the only person that I known that could bring that type of pressure from the inside that we played against was Reggie White. But yeah. think about it; he was an end. They used to move him inside, so yeah. he wasn't just a and primary he was shade guy. And do some of those Absolutely. things. Absolutely, New York is taking him and say, "Hey, right over the center, yes. and let's do it." Now you've got to make a decision. And, and and it's preventing quarterbacks from stepping up, allowing those guys like Thibodeau on the edge to, to be a little Absolutely. bit more effective. But just the worst pressure for a quarterback, right, is that pressure right up the right middle. Up the middle. TT. That's it's right. Because you heard what I say I want to yeah. try to do as a tackle. Well, if my quarterback can't step up in the middle, guess what? He's going to start trying to get out to the outside. It's going to make my job harder. And like you saying with Dexter, man, I it's just the brute power of this guy, man. I don't see him take some guys and just march them back to the quarterback and it's just his size and how he uses his leverage in that middle and it's hard to block him and then the other thing I think that's helping him a lot too TT you got Leonard Williams in there yeah. too so Leonard is a great you know and I think they play him more the three and everything but Leonard's a space either too so if you, if you got uh, Dexter driving you back then again you still have somebody in Leonard Williams who's there to kind of recover or who can recover once he drives you back so you're right Frank it's going to be big on Frank and you know I seen when Frank kind of hurt his foot in the game or kind of hurt himself in the game and and everything and you know Frank had a challenge over him so I think you have to be totally healthy to fight to fight a guy like that. If not, I think then what's going to be key is for our run game to go to the five and the six holes, mm-hmm. meaning run towards our tackles, yeah. then more so trying to run towards the middle of the, off- of the offense. Yeah, I, when you have a guy like that, a, a Reggie White like you played against, how much easier is it to play games off in, in, in the middle off him and play off that penetration and, and how much – more difficult for the interior guys. And I, I know you played on the outside. You were mostly focused on, on one guy all the time. But for those interior guys, when they play those games, when you get that penetration from the nose, how much more difficult is it to, to kind of get yourself over here to play that stunt? Yeah. You know, it, does it just make everything more difficult so, for you offensively? So, TT, so when I was at the University of Florida, they put me inside mm-hmm. at the guard position. TT, that last 
lasted maybe three days. <laughs> and I told them, oh, my goodness, put me back at time. Because, man, everything happened so fast. And you got to have your head on the swivel because you don't know which direction it's coming from when you play on the inside. Of course, me at tackle position. I got this guy right here. I know I'm, I got yeah. the outside guy. But inside, and like I say, TT, it happens fast. You could get a, a linebacker walk up in the A gap. That might change the way you have to block. So to your point, what you're saying is that when they run those games and they run them inside, you have to be focused in as an offensive lineman and you have to be able to move those games and switch those games quickly or they will. They'll get penetration. They'll knock off this guy and that'll create a natural gash for the other defensive linemen to come in. So it's going to be important for the old linemen, those three interior guys, keep your shoulders square the whole time. You can't turn your shoulders when you're in this inside because it's, it's hard, hard to, to recover, back. right? Everything you do, you got to make sure your, your shoulders are square to the line of scrimmage so you can react, read and react. Tough matchup this week for Frank Ragnow, Jordan yeah. Jackson, Evan Brown, and, and potentially Dan Skipper if if, if, uh, if if Frank can't go. So that'll be one I, I kind of keep my eye on. Yes, sir. And especially early in the game, how much that impacts them. Well, let's finish with this. I'm on Ross St. Brown, kind of back to his old ways yeah. again with 10 questions. Boy, he, he looked like he felt good last Last week, oh, didn't TT, he? I love and he's going to face Darnell Holmes, Darnay Holmes. Um, they're 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 a nickel cornerback most of the time, likely. But what did you like about Amon Ra last Man. week? Man, so I always say this about him: he always seemed to be in the right place mm -hmm. at the right time. And I'm telling you, to me. He can pick a, a zone. You can't run a zone against him because he is so well, so good at sitting down, finding the soft spot in that zone and sitting down and making himself big for Jared to get the ball to him. And it, it's so impressive because you normally don't see young guys be able to read the zone and sit down in the zone, TT. A lot of times they'll keep running. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. the quarterback either want them to sit down or they wanted them to continue to run. It it just seems like with Amar Ross St. Brown, him and Jared are on the same page, especially when it comes to zone defenses, how he's able to find the soft spot. I like Tom Kennedy, too. I think Tom does a good job of doing that, too. But finding the soft spots in those defenses, and I think that's going to be important, especially when um, the Giants aren't running any man defense. Yeah. I think it's just going to be important for them to be able to find those soft spots, because I do think they're going to provide some pressure on Jared and I need Jared to be a little bit more comfortable. I don't know if you felt the way I felt, TT, but I just thought early in the Chicago game, I just thought he wasn't comfortable early in that game for some reason. I don't know why, but hopefully we'll be able to get him comfortable early yeah. in this game because I do think the Giants are going to bring a lot of pressure, like you saying, from the outside, yeah. but also from the inside. Too. You know, and Holmes has been pretty good this year. No touchdowns allowed. I think opposing quarterbacks have an 81.7 passer rate against him so he's been pretty good and that's a good matchup but to, but to your point too it, Holmes is that security blanket yes. for Jared isn't he yes like when you talked about when you when you when you aren't f you know comfortable when you're still trying to feel the game out which, which I agree early in that game was Jared you go to the guy that that you feel most comfortable with right your security blanket guy and you, he's closest receiver to you in the yep. slot he's got all that room in the middle to work and and look St. Brown's been great now with after 10 catches last week uh, top 10 in the NFL all mm. time in terms of the most catches in, in a player's first 25 games. I think wow. he was at 139. Wow. So, I mean, he's, you know. TT, we have had some good receipts, some yeah, great been, receivers a come couple through on your here. Teams. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, that's impressive. That's an impressive stat, wow. right? I mean, yeah. some pretty big names on that wow. list, too. And so, good on St. Saint, Saint Brown. But I think that's going to be a key one. Yeah. Can he have just as much success as he did last week? And, and you know what else I love, Loam, is the way they got him the football, yeah. right? Going back to lining him absolutely. up in the backfield, doing some of the yep. jet sweep stuff. I mean, that's important, yep. right? Absolutely, TT. And I say that on our radio broadcast, I just love what Ben Johnson does with him. Because like you say, you never know where he's going to be at. And that's so much pressure that you put on the defense trying to identify where he is. If he's going in motion, who goes in motion with him? When he's in the backfield lined up, who's responsible? Are we going to put a linebacker on him just in case he goes out on the path? It's just so many things that he does to kind of put your defense in the predicament or make your defense make decisions. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and like I say, he never complains. 
And the most important thing to me now for Jared is to have a guy like him because, you know, with T.J. Hawkinson being gone, a guy, right, your tight end normally works the middle of the field, works down the hash mark. Now with Amar Ross St. Brown, I see they do that with him. Mm -hmm. They work the middle of the field. They work the hashes with him. And, of course, they work the sidelines with him. So you're right, T.T. I think right now, even out of Josh Reynolds, we know they've been hurt, and Trinity and all those guys, I think Amar Ross St. Brown, I think he is the guy for Jared Goff. Great stuff, Lone. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. man we, you that's how in, we you chop it in, energy. man. We have I to chop it. it. Hey, that's how we do it here. We chop it up like that. I love it, man. That was great stuff. And so, yeah. obviously, big matchup this week. You know, Lions are trying to get three in a row. You know, I, th I think legitimate, legitimate legitimize themselves a little bit yes. too you know yes. you know you win three in a row you win two on the road but this is a team very much in the playoff picture in yes the NFC, playing some pretty good football so you know I think you get this one you say okay I, th I think Dan Campbell and these guys are, are, are certainly headed in the right direction I think I think that anyways but I think that maybe lets the country know that there you go TT. okay and and obviously New York is, is trying to get to eight and two, stay close to Philadelphia and, and continue to be in the playoff picture. So yep. look, it'll be a great one in New York on Sunday. We'll see if the Lions get three in a row. Loam, good stuff, man. Hey, man I appreciate I got you. you, TT. I got you. <laughs>